Good morning. Today we are trying to discuss the novel Heat and Dust written by Ruth Praver Chabwala. So right at the outset I also need to tell you that the discussions on this novel Heat and Dust needs to be situated also within the discussions that we have been having in the last a few sessions. So we may uh, ask questions about identity, about authorship, how particular ideas of uh, author also informs the reception of uh, certain kind of works. And Chabwala in that sense is particularly interesting as she occupies a very different kind of a very unique kind of a role in this uh, entire gamut of Indian fiction in English. She started writing uh, rather early in the sense that given that this is such a young narrative genre that uh, began to uh, acquire different kind of status in the post independence period. We can s even say that she is one of the early writers of Indian writing, uh, Indian writing in English and her identity uh, is uh, rather contested. Meenakshi Mukherjee spoke about her as an extreme case of the outsider in the commonwealth context. If you uh, glean through the literary works, the critical works available on Ruth Pravar Chabwala, we may begin to notice that the term outsider is used extensively as far as her writings are concerned. And uh, just like her identity is contested, we begin to notice that in Chabwala's fiction, most of the protagonists, most of the characters that she introduced to us also occupy a, a very contested position between the inside and the outside and they are mostly, connect, mostly considered as outsiders as well. John Abdike, another contemporary author also described her as an initiated outsider. And one of the mm, critical commentaries that uh, appeared in a British newspaper also referred to her as an outsider with unusual insight. So while her approach towards characters, towards India, towards a lived experience in India has generally been seen as uh, the kind informed by an outsider, we also need to understand that her position is not comparable to that of someone like E. M. Foster. She has been um, uh, living in India in various capacities and uh, she has acquired a different kind of lived experience that a colonialist like uh, that a British writer like uh, uh, E. M. Foster could not himself acquire. Most, most of the details will be uh, discussed when we uh, look at the novel in detail. And uh, before we get into the novel, it is very important to know the unique kind of position that uh, uh, Ruth Pravar Chabwala occupies in this entire uh, scheme of Ind Indian English fiction. Yeah. Her origins are uh, very interesting and this also leads to her being clubbed, uh, her being dubbed as outsider right from the outset. She uh, is of Polish Jewish origin and she has a very troubled family history. Her family had to uh, flee the Nazis and move to London in 1939 and it was rather a traumatic childhood that she had. Her father when uh, later he came to know that his, the entire family of about 40 members in the family were uh, killed in the concentration camps. He could not take it uh, anymore and he also committed uh, suicide. So, it was a very troubled traumatic childhood that Chabwala had and um, she pursued her education in UK and she also met this Indian Cyrus Chabwala, an architect, a student architect who was based, uh, who was uh, uh, in London then and they get married and moved to India by 1951 and from then for about 24 years she has lived in India. But nevertheless, this uh, uh, stay was rather you know, troublesome for her. She has uh, written uh, and spoken about how she could not really uh, fit well within this context. This has also been the source of a lot of criticism when it comes to uh, Chabwala's works. And uh, she wrote prolifically, uh, we must acknowledge, and her eighth novel, which is Heat and Dust, the novel that we, we shall be discussing today, it uh, won the Booker Prize in 1975. But what is very surprising about Chabwala's work being a Booker event is that we rarely acknowledge this Booker event uh, uh, when compared to the later Booker events such as uh, Rushdie and Arundhati Roy. And uh, very few students of English literature even have come to know that she is one of the rare writers who have uh, got the rare uh, distinction of having won both these awards, Booker Award and the, the Booker Prize and an Oscar award during their uh, career. And she in that since wrote prolifically had a uh, very diversified kind of career and she 
couldn't continue to live in India for a long time and after 24 years she moves back to New York. She wrote a screenplays extensively, successful screenplays for Merchant and Ivory films and she was a well acclaimed screenplay writer during her lifetime. She also won two Oscars, uh, one in 1987 and one in 1993. So here's Jhabwala for us with a very unique personality and a very diverse literary and artistic career. And she lived in uh, New York till her death in, in 2013. And um, um, it, it, uh, though she wrote prolifically and though her status in Indian English fiction is rather uncontested, it also needs to be mentioned that she always had to struggle with her, the issues related to her identity. The critics were not ready to accept her for what she is and she also find, found it very problematic to deal with the, the uh, contested position that she occupied. She was oscillating between the Indian identity that she acquired through marriage and the original identity of hers which was obviously predominantly European. So while, we are con while uh, the critics wrote about her Eurocentric perspective, one also needs to be attentive to the limits of uh, canon, to the limits of uh, critical understanding that uh, we have been exposed to. In one of the first sessions when we were talking about Rushdie, when we were talking about how he was uh, making his selection to his anthology, how he spoke about uh, uh, in writing, how he spoke about the uh, contestations of language, about Indianness and about various other things related to Indian uh, writing in English, we noticed that there is no way in which he uh, condescendingly refers to the different kinds of identities with respect to uh, Indianness. In fact, he is more, uh, he, he is harsher to the ones who are considered legitimately Indian. He is harsher to the ones who occupy the regional parochial spaces. But nevertheless, this is really not a position that we can always embrace either given that uh, the Eurocentric tradition, the Eurocentric approach always needs to be uh, needs, needs to be curbed because that uh, goes against the very spirit of post-colonial writing as well. And um, some of the writers have, uh, some of the critics have even found uh, uh, Jhabwala's writing, uh, writing is very pedestrian and uh, when she won the book, uh, there was a lot of resentment against her. There were a lot of uh, arguments which came up saying that she really didn't deserve it. One, her language was pedestrian and uh, two, she was not writing in the ideal spirit of uh, post-colonialism. So how do we engage with these kind of uh, different questions? So how do we begin to situate someone like uh, Ruth Pravar Chabwala who is not of Indian origin, who has only lived in India as pa uh, following her marriage, who has not adopted Indianness in ways that are acceptable to uh, say the critical tradition. These are some of the interesting questions that uh, we should begin to ask and how do we understand this kind of a contested identity vis-a-vis -vis Rushdi who also is an Indian writer who currently does not hold an Indian passport. So how do we engage with these various formulations and how do we begin to uh, situate the personal identity and begin to evaluate the uh, literary work in connection with that. Shabwala herself was quite aware of the rootlessness that uh, she was always uh, uh, blamed for. In one of her own writings, she uh, made the statement, I stand before you as a writer without any ground of being out of which to write, really blown out, really blown about from country to country, culture to culture, till I feel, till I am nothing. If we try to do an analysis of her life story, and compare it with the stories that she has uh, produced as part of her fiction, we begin to see that the rootlessness that she had been experiencing, perhaps right from her childhood, from the moment the family fled from the uh, Nazis and uh, sought refuge in London and later uh, during her move from London to India and then back to New York, we see that the same kind of rootlessness and the same sort of shifting identities can be seen in most of her characters as well. This is going to be very much evident in our discussion of Heat and Dust where we talk about uh, the, uh, the lead character Olivia, the nameless narrator and we also begin to see how she is capable of looking at India as an outsider. But however, this 
capability, if we may call it so. This capability of looking into India as an outsider has never been seen as a credible quality as far as Indian writing in English is concerned. If you again recall the discussions that we had earlier on Kantapura, where we have this particular uh, writer, Raja Rao, who leaves India, India just before the major breakout of the nationalist uh, 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 moment. He leaves India in, India in 1919 and he leaves India in 1929 and we find that this work is written uh, in, in, in another 5-6 years. But nevertheless, we find it very, very comfortable to identify Raja Rao as a nationalist writer, irrespective of the many number of years that he spent abroad, that he taught abroad, the fact that he got married to people who were of uh, not Indian origin, those things do not come in the way of uh, uh, shaping his identity or his perception as an Indian, writing, uh, Indian writer in English. But on the contrary, when it comes to a writer like uh, Jhabwala, the many things that she speaks, the different ways in which she lives her life, everything stands testimony against her skill of looking into India as an outsider. It is not clearly seen as a uh, as, as a legitimate voice, it is not seen as a perspective which needs to be encouraged either. And these are certain dichotomies that we should be alert to and more than the story that uh, 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 Jhabwala tells us, especially in a, a work like Heat and Dust, we need, to, we need to be alert to the undertones of that, the possibility of developing a character like Olivia or the nameless narrator, does it rest only with the outsider. When it comes to the insiders, if you look at the other women writers in English, which we shall be go doing in, the, in, 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 in due course in this as part of this course, we begin to see that the women characters are entirely different. The women characters are confined to their home. The women characters are confined to a certain domestic space. There is a certain confinement which becomes acceptable which becomes rather legitimate when it comes to the uh, women writers in English. And even in that uh, account, if you uh, look at the women writers who have been contributing to this uh, vast uh, well, this uh, vast body of uh, uh, Indian writing in English, we see that Chabwala occupies a distinctly different position. Her women and say the women characters of Anita Desai or Kamla Markandi or Shashida Deshpande cannot be compared we find a distinctly different quality of independence, a distinctly different uh, grammar of uh, morality, a grammar of uh, individuality, all of that influencing the formulation of uh, the various characters within uh, heat and dust. And also the, uh, the, the personal element which uh, is uh, in dialogue with the political, uh, particularly the colonial moment of that uh, period. That's also very telling when it comes to heat and dust. While we, um, while some of them, some of the critics are quite right in uh, critiquing uh, Chabwala for her Eurocentric perspective, we also need to admit that the women in her uh, uh, in, in her uh, novels, whether it is Olivia or the uh, nameless narrator who is narrate who is uh, tr tracing the story of uh, uh, her grandmother Olivia, we find that they are caught in a position between tread, they are caught in a position which is not entirely always advantageous to them. While we, uh, while we are uncomfortable with the ways in which they are uh, looking down upon certain aspects of India, their discomfort with the climate for example, we may not totally appreciate it. But we also need to understand that they are also, those women are also caught in a very difficult position. Patriarchy has a different kind of import uh, for them. Yeah? They are free to have the relationships, they are free to have relationships with the men whom they choose in their life. It looks very liberating again as an outsider. But Olivia, but uh, uh, Chabwala, who is able to get into the heart of her characters, heart of the women characters, she begins to show us how that always necessarily does not become a position of privilege how that they are also the women who are the uh, who are left behind as who are uh, the women who are being brought along as byproducts of colonialism or who have been left behind 
uh, a different kind of a story as part of uh, colonialism. They do not necessarily assume the kind of uh, uh, perspective or the kind of position that the male colonialists always uh, uh, had enjoyed. So, it is rather unfair in fact to uh, treat her writings as Eurocentric as uh, when we compare her to the other male writers who have predominantly written with a Eurocentric perspective. At some level, we also need to be very attentive to the new kinds of uh, nuances that uh, uh, Chabwala is giving us because it uh, we do not have too many narratives written by women who tells us what it is to be an outsider about a woman who is confined within the domestic space in a rather different way, but at the same time occupying a privileged position, occupying a status of uh, uh, the uh, colonialist and at the same time not being allowed to respond in the way that the male colonialists are entitled to. So, it is this difference, it is this distinctness that we need to be extremely alert to that would also enable us to read the novel in a very different way and also uh, understand the uh, 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 different imports of uh, hmm, legitimacy about uh, identity and uh, issues like that when we uh, read the work. Uh, the critical tradition overall we must say it has uh, paid very little serious attention to most of Chabwala's works and particularly Heat and Dust. In fact, it would be interesting to know that uh, the moment she won the uh, Booker Prize, the event did not work much in her favour, say the way it worked for someone like Rushdi or later for Ayunthadi Roy. There was a lot of resentment against her because here is a nation who is trying to prove its worth to the uh, English, uh, uh, to, 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 to the uh, uh, rest of the world. Here is a young nation who has begun writing in English. So, the fact that here is a nation with a set of writers who have just started uh, writing in English and they are also gaining some amount of international attention. But the fact that an outsider woman, a woman who has only lived in India but who is not of Indian origin has been granted this coveted prize was never seen as a, as a, uh, as an, uh, as a thing to be appreciated. Yeah? Which is why when we traditionally look at the way the uh, the story of Indian writing in English is told. Rushdie's Booker event is celebrated as the first mega event, the entry into the international market. Rushdie's Midnight's Children occupies the distinct position. It continues to occupy the distinct position of having changed the entire identity and the entire uh, reception of Indian writing in English in the international scene. Whereas Chabwala's receives very, very limited critical attention, limited commercial attention despite the fact that she went on to win two coveted uh, awards during her uh, uh, literary career. And uh, her authenticity in and worth is much contested both in terms of her identity as well as in terms of the writings that she has produced and she has been vastly critiqued for her old fashioned colonial attitudes and she herself has not really uh, tried to come out of um, those sort of barriers either. In fact, she has always been said that you need not look at me as a as an Indian writer. Yeah? Look at me as a European who has certain lived experience in India and this will continue to inform the way in which we write. So, it would be rather right to say that when we look at uh, Chabwala's works and uh, uh, quite appropriately heat and dust because that this is the most visible of all her works we see that there is a certain blind spot in the critical tradition, in the critical oeuvre that we are not, either we are not allowed to see that or we do not know the frameworks within which this needs to be situated. So, these are perhaps certain questions that should drive your, uh, your uh, uh, research interest as and when you uh, progress, yeah? not about the way in which currently Chabwala is being taught or thought in the critical tradition, but enable yourself to think about the ways in which the new possibilities that needs to be opened up in uh, the sphere of crit in, in the critical tradition of uh, uh, Indian writing in English. Yeah? And also perhaps ask certain questions like if we begin to uh, give the same kind of legitimacy, authenticity and worth to Chabwala, just like we have been giving to say Rushdie or uh, uh, Arundhati Roy, what is at stake? 
Yeah, that's a very useful question to ask. What is at stake when certain kinds of writers, certain kinds of writings are included into this critical tradition, which is otherwise defined in a very different way? Yeah, what is at stake? Yeah, this should be a lead question which you uh, should enable yourself to ask at various points of this discussion. Heat and Dust is a novel which has a nameless narrator and the nameless narrator is an idea with endless possibilities. In today when uh, one of the students will be introducing the uh, novel Heat and Dust to you, you will see how the nameless narrator is being presented as, a, as an important narrative trope. And this is not a singular instance in Indian writing in English. We will also find a number of other uh, novels using the nameless narrators to tell their own stories. For example, we shall be looking at this work uh, Shadow Lines by Amitav Ghosh, which also has a very engaged active narrator who remains a nameless. Yeah. So, how does this work in uh, the within the uh, scope of uh, narrative, within the scope of narration? And narrative theories would tell you about the endless possibilities that a nameless narrator offers, yeah, or perhaps a child narrator offers, yeah. And um, the voice of the narrator, and by allowing her to be left nameless, yeah, that is also about an inability to pinpoint the nature or the identity of the narrator because just like the narrator who has been left nameless in heat and dust by extension we can say that there is a certain namelessness there is a certain inability to identify the identity with chabwala that chabwala as a writer occupies yeah and one really wouldn't know how to uh, talk about the, the authorial voice at some level it is the author, the narrator is endlessly fascinated by what India offers and at a certain other level we also find that this authorial voice or this voice of narration is also extremely uncomfortable with the heat and dust that India offers. Yeah? And uh, for that matter the title heat and dust was uh, much uh, uh, criticized because the many of the many of the critics, uh, many of the well meaning critics they thought that undue attention was being drawn to the unfavorable things in India that too from the perspective of an outsider of a European yeah, that undue attention was being given to certain things within India which need not be projected yeah. like Raja Rao's Kantapura. Yeah. Why couldn't these writers, why couldn't Chabwala talk about the exotic value of India? Why couldn't Chabwala talk about the endless mystic possibilities that, uh, that a country like India offers? Yeah. Perhaps these must have been the questions that drove the critical tradition. Yeah. Before we move into the novel, I also want to remind you that it is not as if only writers of uh, uh, European origin have spoken about the unfavorable climate and the discomforting heat and dust which is uh, prevalent in this uh, country. If you look at a novel like uh, Shashi Tharoor's Right which will also be discussed in this course, we will see that we have a protagonist Lakshman, an urban educated civil servant. He is being placed in the rural hinterlands in the northern part of India. He is extremely uncomfortable with the heat and dust over there. We have another character from uh, Woman New Chatterjee's uh, English August, the protagonist Agastya, who is again a civil servant, urban, educated, very suave, yeah? and he is also forced to work in the rural hinterlands of northern India. We find him also complaining endlessly about the heat and dust. He is unable to make friends with who are around him. He looks down upon the rural Indian. The same thing happens in riot as well, the rules of novel riot as well. But while we are able to take this kind of a perspective, while we are able to, to uh, legitimately uh, accept this sort of a perspective from an Indian writer, why does it become so difficult when the heat and dust is being talked about as being uh, foregrounded by a writer who's lived in India but who's had a, who has a European uh, origin? Of course, I am not in any way 
trying to legitimize the Eurocentric view which uh, heat industry of course has in, uh, in, in various uh, uh, capacities. But at the same time, it is very important to ask these questions about legitimacy. Who has the legitimate right? Who has, who possesses the legitimate voice to offer criticism against the reality, against the lived experiences in this country? How do we gain it? Is this a claim which comes to us by birth or do we lay our hands on it by occupying certain legitimate positions? Or do we have a way in which we measure it according to the number of years that someone has lived in India? This question of identity comes up every now and then if you notice in various contexts. In one of the other novels that we had taken a look at, Waiting for the Mahatma, there we find that there is a colonial administrator who is trying to tell this Gandhian, uh, highly enthused protagonist that I have lived more number of years in this country than you have ever lived. So does that make one, do the number of years make one legitimately Indian? Or is it something that you just acquire by birth and continue to cling on to it forever regardless of where you live or what your lived experiences are after that? Yeah, one truly doesn't know. But what we need to uh, be uncomfortable with is the cute surety with which the critical tradition operates and the uh, desperate attempts that it uh, makes, the critical tradition makes to ensure that certain people are allowed to talk in certain ways and certain others are not. Yeah? So this idea of legitimacy about who gets the maximum right to talk about the nation in particular ways, that is something that we need to come back to time and again as part of this course. So here I uh, leave you with this and uh, while we are talking about certain details, certain themes, certain aspects of heat and dust, I also want these questions to remain in the back of your mind and inform your understanding of the uh, novel. Yeah? And uh, we shall not be giving a, a summary of the novel and uh, uh, hopefully there would be not too many spoilers either. I encourage you to read the novel and also appreciate it for what it is and then be informed by the discussions that we have as part of this course. Okay, um, like, uh, like Nitin guessed, it is slightly about climate also. So I would come back to the title later in the presentation. So this uh, text emerged during the Anglophone writing uh, period of the Commonwealth countries or the countries which which were colonies at a point of time. Mostly, it is to introduce the book and locate the uh, text in the trajectory of Indian fiction. However, this te uh, text is slightly funny because you can't actually categorize into anything. There is so much of contestation in uh, the identity of the book, the author, so it's slightly yeah, awkward there. So, there is, uh, so, the relevance of the text and the politics over the author in the text. These are like slight information about, common information about the book. Book of Prayer, as you all know. So this is a story but two parallel between two times and two characters who are women and they are uh, in a relation like old woman and her step granddaughter. And it is in the form of epistolary no, uh, ep uh, letters, so therefore it's an epistolary novel. And so uh, Ruth was in India between 1951 and 1975, and this was the time she started writing. Uh, books on experiences in India and uh, things on India itself. So she is put in the tradition of expatriate uh, writing. Even though her story starts with being an immigrant from uh, Germany, she settles in England, then India and then shifts between US and India. But she comes under the uh, uh, expatriate tradition with Ewan Foster and Rudyard Kipling and uh, yeah. So this uh, Anglo-Indian writing versus Indo-Anglian uh, Indo writing it's because Anglo-Indian writing is uh, the ones who were once upon a time in the colonial power itself. They were part of the power, they represent the power and then they started writing about India or the colonies. However, um, Indo-Anglian writing is Indian fiction in writing. So there is a difference and she does not fit into uh, the Indo-Anglian writing rather in the Anglo-Indian writing. And however, she also departs from the expatriate writing because she does not talk about the relations between India and the uh, colonial power but between the relations in uh, India itself. Yeah, and her changing perception is seen throughout the novel. Ruth was asked if she could be considered an Indian. 
she said this no how could i be if i must be considered anything then it let it be as one of the european writers who have written about india so this also caused a lot of um, her reception of the book itself so you all know the story of the uh, uh, novel it's about this uh, woman english uh, woman married to this officer and later she falls in love with this uh, nawab in india and then she runs away with him because of complications and step granddaughter comes in search of her and she retraces her step after 50 years however there are yeah incidentally her life also follows the same track as olivia olivia is the character from 1920s these are the themes cross cultural uh, encounters between uh, british and india there are two levels of encountering india for the british one is physically and one is metaphysically physically is because they go through uh, they experience the social life the geography of the location however it is metaphysically because they learn to respond to indian art and um, religion and philosophy and later in the book we see a lot of people um, from england and foreign countries coming into india for spiritual uh, tours and pilgrims british response to india can be divided into two times like one in the during the raj british raj and the other one is during the indian era itself after the in the 1970s after the independence so in the first story which involves olivia we see that the relationship between the british and uh, india is very much political and so it even shows douglas learning uh, the indian hindustani language of satipur because he wants to rule better and uh, you can see through the uh, characters attitude towards the country and the con- uh, people they most of them in unison consider indians to be rogues and they they think indians are uh, cunning and so there is this issue of sati brought up and it it shows how the contesting ideas about sati how um, all the uh, english people find sati to be very um, against it's a social issue and they ca- consider it to be a savagery however olivia is slightly different from the english people in that sense and she thinks that it's a part of the culture and therefore british should accept it as it is in uh, british response to india in 1970s is different in the sense that uh, people now there is no more uh, the necessity for them to be in india how would they choose to stay back in india and some of them come back for spiritual pilgrims and th- some of the in- uh, english people choose to stay back in india itself for uh, because they like the indian environment but not the indian people so then they still uh, ended up staying back in both the uh, behaviors of the uh, both the behaviors in both the uh, times we can see that there is this uh, accepted notion that india changes people however the degree of change and how the change is accepted is through how much they are grounded in their own uh, culture and how much they think they are superior to the other and this causes a lot of uh, friction between the acceptance of indians for the british going to indian response to the british the whole novel is a very western view of what the indians consider british to be they also think that uh, you, uh, indians put it in the past and then they still are very uh, they have this nostalgia towards the british and yeah they are still uh, accommodating to the british even after the independence this can be seen through indralal's providing accommodation for the narrator and later this character called chid during the raj era the only um indian response or indian character main character we see is nawab himself however his character is not very um respectable in those lines and therefore he does not he is very he cares about his personal things and he is not very much into the he does not care about the politics of the uh, country at that point however just the power he is losing out on and how uh, even though he hates the british for that uh, for the reason that his power has been diminished he does not show towards olivia or harry his whom he accommodates in his palace yeah so the narrator uh, keeps talking about how she can see indralal finding it difficult to accept her and accept the fact that she would choose to come and stay in india over staying in a better developed country with more facilities and easier life uh, later in the novel you see there is this um, character called dr gopal and he complains about how india was never meant to be a place for people to stay and there are so many diseases and people should not actually stay in india and they should walk away from the country because it's very badly maintained and there's a lot of corruption there's a lot of diseases and yeah it is not suitable for life so through the novel we see the narration is such that you don't see the perception of common man in um, responding to british because 
uh, it is very much revolve around Nawab's uh, identity or Nawab's um, characterization and the later in the lal and that is pretty much most you know about the characters from Indian uh, society or the places. So, Jabwala, she portrays India in a different sense from uh, in such, she tries to see uh, the, she portrays the narrator in such that she, the narrator looks for differences between the 1920s and the 1970s. However, by the end of the novel, you realize that she comes back to the same perception Western countries had about India itself. Jawala can be con again considered as a white writer and not uh, in the sense that she succumbs back to the Western ideas of India. This novel shifts between post-colonial writing and colonial writing where uh, because of the t change in the time frame. And then, however, so therefore, but in majority of the part, it can't be put in the post-colonial literature because uh, there is no sense of um, resistance towards British we actually see across the novel. It's very minute in details. So there are a lot of differences. The movement in the novel is projected to be sent uh, from the center to the periphery. So after, uh, like during the uh, during the colonial era, there were a lot of migration, mass migration. So, most of them, even though uh, 1970s novels in general showed a, a migration from the periphery or the third world countries to the first world countries in, um, to, in settling down of people, this showed a very um, from uh, center to the periphery uh, movement. However, it does not show collective movement as such, but the individuals incidentally are moving from center to periphery. The idea of men and women in the novel is very blur and they are contested and there's a lot of discrepancies in the characters itself. So there's no clear cut characters for any of the novels and all of them have some, in retrospect, have some kind of a bad uh, reception in general. So love and culture is another theme where it is very dislocated. It's not the um, pure love in sense of what the other novels project because due to the stories in 1920s and the 1970s between Olivia and the Nawab and the narrator and Indralal. So there is this, it dislocates the whole concept of love itself and culture there is, um, again uh, there is not much difference in um, what was found in 1920s and 1970s. Female friendship, it is because um, the narrator identifies with Olivia through the letters that was, um, that she uh, possessed or she got hold of and uh, however there were no other personal relationship between them and we, we see um, narrator getting along with the um, Satipur community uh, women in the later uh, later stages of the no novel where one of the prominent character was Maji and she gets very close and she also goes there for guidance and um, However, in 1920s, Olivia does not get along with the Nawab's family. So, Be Begum, the Nawab's mo mother, she does not like Olivia at all and there you can see through the uh, narration that an identity, identity is contested throughout the novel and in the author itself because I did earlier tell about um, her being expatriate and also her claim to not be an Indian writer but it being an Indian fiction itself. And uh, it can be seen in Olivia, it can be seen in narrator where they don't relate themselves to their community but they tend to follow, uh, they, t they tend to be attracted towards Indian um, <coughs> ways but still not be accepted as Indian uh, because they are still considered to be outsider. And Indian poverty does not change throughout 1920s and 1940, uh, 1970s and throughout the narrator's uh, view in her journal, we can see her going back to Indian poverty again and again and hippies are the people who uh, here in this, here uh, hippies are the ones, uh, the youth coming in from the foreign countries. So here uh, this can also, uh, so this factor is also related to this another case called Sobr Shobraj case in uh, 1970s when this man from France, his name was Charles so Shobraj, he went around murdering people um, who are on pilgrims. So you, he murdered dozen, uh, dozens of people in India itself and then he was caught and then he broke out of jail and then he was put into life sentence. Uh, later. Um, so yeah, that also played a major role because um, there are uh, there is this another character Chid who portrays the uh, pseudo spirituality in India in the sense that he comes in and search for spirituality with two other people, however they can't put up with the climate or the uh, social uh, or the life in India so they all return back. Even in that case there, he, there is this uh, other, um, his behavior does not reach up to the other. Uh, 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 supposed to be holy men, holy men 
of the spiritual pilgrims. So, climate like, so the heat and dust itself, um, the title itself is contested for the reason that it, uh, it shows that throughout the novel in 90, uh, throughout the uh, narration in 1920s, we see that the British complaining about heat a lot and anytime anything goes bad between their uh, relation or their mood, they blame it on the climate. So, this portrayal established a sense that um, British stayed back even though they could not put up with the climate because they had a responsibility towards it and that also establishes the white burden, uh, white's burden again. So, um, there are a lot of critiques critiquing the title itself of the novel because they, they need not have done that but yeah, so that is there. Question of authenticity because of the insider outsider of both the narrator and the author itself. So, features of this novel in general, it has a female protagonist, there is Olivia, however, she is not doing anything as such but the incidences push her into, her decisions are not properly reasoned out but it, so she could also in a sense be considered passive because she is just reacting to the occurrences around her. So, yeah, she uses a very simple language and there is a lot of irony in all the narration and you can see a lot of cultural stereotypes. So, there is this um, Purnima Bose. She talks about the um, relationship between literature and culture itself. So, it shows how the uh, literature was used to talk about the colonial regimes of knowledge in the sense that to put across what uh, their sense of view and their sense of knowledge itself. And this was uh, through the uh, expression of individualism in the novels, in the characters. That was, there were four kind of uh, individuals in the character, the main characters. One was rogue colonial, uh, colonialist and feminist nationalist, heroic nationalist and heroic colonist. So, the Douglas character from the 1920s is showed as a heroic colonialist in the sense that he feels responsible to do his duties properly and administrate over Satipur properly. And another feature of this novel is it is distanced from the works of that same time on the lines of it being very silent on the political clashes. It's very, it, this novel is considered very personal in the sense that it does not talk about the other, um, since it was supposed to be uh, during the time of 1920s when there were nationalist movements coming up and even that was around few years later uh, after the Amritsar massacre and therefore there should have been a lot of political tensions that should have been that could have been portrayed but it was not portrayed and therefore it was considered very silent and therefore it was considered away from the works of time because we saw in the other two novels talking about Gandhian movement itself. So, this also proves the western view again. So, uh, changes in India, so there are only, there are very small things that were changed in India itself. So, most of the poverty, geographical area, the climate, everything remains in the same, the attitude of the people remains the same except for the fact that the civil lines that existed during the British era was used as um, government quarters or government offices and also that um, Indian scenario itself became more pathetic in after the 50 years that was the maximum change she actually saw. So, the whole uh, the novel keeps repeating the question of whether it was uh, desirable for Europeans to stay, uh, stay in India after independence because of the social life in India itself and how Indians would have considered Europeans. Salman Rushdie considers her to be a rootless intellectual. Most of the politics around the author is because she does not have a very uh, concrete identity and th that, therefore even though her work is considered very um, prominent in those times, it was not very accepted by the Indians for the same reason that she is an outsider. So, Salman Rushdie even considers, uh, sa therefore he comments saying that. There are always these questions of who was she writing for and what was the target audience and therefore, uh, but there was no, there is no actually answer for that questions. The structure of the novel, the uh, things she speaks about brings in these questions. Even though it was supposed to be a um, Indian novel or Indian fiction, it supported the colonial view itself. Her major works were on the relationship between the colonial power and the colonies they are portrayed comically. The portrayal of India in uh, these manners also is questioned if she was an anti-Indian itself. She received a lot of criticism because of this and in 1970s even though she had a large audience outside India but the Indians um, did not consider her very prominent a writer for her views and also because there were other uh, writers who with the nationalist view then. By 1980s there was other prominent writers that overshadowed uh, Ruth Pravar itself. She is also compared to Jane Austen and E.M. Foster for her themes. 
So Jane Austen, because she talks about the um, upper class social life and the domestic life in England. However, uh, so Ruth Prawar was considered to be Jane Austen in India because she also spoke about the upper class life of Olivia itself and it had a clear cut space Olivia used. And so she was compared with E.M. Foster because of his uh, A Passage to India where Ruth's uh, work and Foster's work was similar on the lines portraying the relationship between British and um, Indians and their experiences that was portrayed and the views both of them held. That was because both Foster's work was contemporary in 1920s, however this was looking back to the past but to the 1920s again. There are a lot of debates over the author and the work for the questions and the problems the uh, work poses itself. Uh, Ruth was uh, criticized a lot for the cross-cultural theme itself. Since she spoke about British and India's relationship, she was expected to be a middleman or I mean in the sense that she was expected to be a uh, representative of both trying to uh, talk about both and be in the middle position. However, her view was leaning towards the colonial view itself or perspective itself. There are a lot of criticisms on her because of that. The relevance of this novel, even though it was very relevant to the 1970s time, it is no more considered relevant because of the post-colonial, uh, it is no more considered post-colonial literature itself on the lines that the relationships are not portrayed in a very um, equivocal view, I guess. So I would end with Meenakshi Mukherjee's um, comment on Ruth Pravar. She says her failure to develop as a, a prominent author and her novel is because it points to one hazard the rootless writer is prone to. While to some writers absence of a single homogeneous culture base sharpens their sensibility, in some others it might result in arrested creative vitality because there is a lot of confusion in the novel, in the identity, in the views and therefore it did not give her a standpoint as such and therefore she lost out on her audience and her reading public itself. Also she keeps comparing her differences between London and India and the use of space. Also the environment in London and India again. For example she brings up garbage. So this, she even brings out an incident where this old lady is lying by a garbage dump and she's all sick but the narrator does not know if she is alive or dead. If she should go pick her up and admit her in the hospital. However admitting her also in the hospital would the doctor would not allow that because he does not have enough space for more patients. And so yeah, this again gives in the view of what she should do and she goes back to Maji and yeah, so Maji lets an old woman die by the end of the thing. Like there is this very nice part before that, so read up.